Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing in Abbotsford, BC, a city in crisis, a province now under a state of emergency. Widespread flooding, fears critical infrastructure could fail, urgent rescues. I knew I was in trouble, um, just seeing the water. And the animals left behind. There's thousands of cows without water. With highways washed out, entire cities still cut off, thousands stranded, and supplies are running low. There's no bread, there's no milk, there's, there's nothing in there. The incredible efforts, big and small, to help BC through the disaster. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Also tonight, Joe Biden pushes an electric vehicle credit. Worse than anything threatened uh, by Donald Trump before. Why that hurts Canada's car industry. And PCR tests to re-enter Canada may be a thing of the past. I just got news of that this morning and it was like early Christmas. Why the expected change won't apply to everyone. This is The National. We are here in Abbotsford, British Columbia, a community and a province in the grips of what some are calling a once in a century disaster. Thousands forced to flee their homes, uncertain of what they'll return to. Tonight, this province is under a state of emergency. The Premier John Horgan speaking today of the enormous challenges ahead and making clear a difficult reality. One person has already died and we should expect more fatalities in the coming days. I've been at this dais over the past two years talking about the challenges we've faced. Unprecedented challenges with public health, wildfires, heat domes and now debilitating floods. Abbotsford is a community already inundated and there are new threats today. Residents were told to stay inside as a fire raged out of control at an RV dealership and overnight heroic efforts to prevent another devastating flood. More than 200 people rescued with a vital pumping station on the verge of failing. This community of more than 160,000, about an hour east of Vancouver, facing more evacuation orders. Hundreds forced from their homes in the Sumas Prairie region to the south and east of the city. Renee Filipponi is following the events unfolding here in Abbotsford. I know you're looking at water levels, and I know you remember yesterday that road was covered. There was a car that was stuck in the water, very different today. Absolutely, and that's good news, but there are concerns about the stability of the roads and the bridges which are being uh, assessed. The next step would be to open those floodgates, and by doing that, some of that water sitting on the Sumas Prairie would be able to get out of the region. But that can't happen until the Fraser River water level drops below the level of the other major river here, the Sumas River. And officials are hoping that will happen in the next 24 to 36 hours. The scope of the damage is shocking, and still, this is an improvement over last night when residents scrambled to safety. Water was rising around Jordan Nyangama after he was unable to evacuate. This is unbelievable. I was planning to leave. It happened so quick, you know, just a complete snap of the fingers. He called 911 and spent part of the night on the roof waiting for help. 3.30 a.m., I was, uh, you know, still, still awake and still... Still, still coherent, and I just I heard a little motor putting down the putting down. I don't know, probably about 500 meters away. Rescue crews had finally arrived. The water was up to my window, like seven feet from the ground, and I just flashed my flashlight. In other words, I thought I would see a, a, a boat float by my bedroom window. Overnight, officials warned of a catastrophic disaster if a pumping station were to fail and send a deluge of water into an already heavily flooded area. Volunteers worked through the night to build a dam. And I just saw this random post on this page of people saying, hey, bring a shovel, come down to the pump station and, uh, and help out. It was just cool because everybody was just like down to work. It's holding for now. This is still a dynamic situation. Uh, we're still monitoring the river levels very closely. We know that this is not over and uh, this can change very quickly. Compounding this emergency was a massive fire at an RV dealership, which raised concerns about toxic smoke. Much of today's rescue effort was focused on the animals. This is an agricultural hub in BC. There are 45,000 dairy cows alone in the Fraser Valley. This farmer says officials at the evacuation roadblocks have prevented them from getting to the barns. There's thousands of cows locked in barns screaming. The water's been cut off. There's thousands of cows without water. 
and crews need to get in, people need to get in to help. Thousands of animals have already died and many more will be euthanized. The agriculture minister says farmers are painting a grim scene. Some of their barns are flooded and you can see the animals that are deceased and it's heartbreaking. All this at a time when the region is essentially cut off from the rest of the country and holding its breath that the pumps will hold. And Ian, everyone we've run into today from grocery stores to cafes, this is all they're talking about. This has really hit people to the core and it's really brought the community together. 300 volunteers came out last night to build that dam. Restaurants are giving out free meals to evacuees. We've spoken with individuals who are collecting donations, all trying to ease some of the suffering of those people who've lost so much. All right, Ian? Renee, thank you very much. With all the major routes to the interior cut off, communities are now starting to run out of goods they need to survive. In the Fraser Valley, there's lots of anxiety and hope and Chilliwack with food, gas and other supplies beginning to run out. Susanna De Silva is in Chilliwack tonight. And Susie, how are people feeling there tonight? Well, people are trying to be patient. There's certainly some frustration at not being able to get some of the goods they would like to get, but many of them are grateful they aren't in some of those hardest hit areas like in Abbotsford. I'm at a grocery store here today. It was very busy. Many people are having to make trips to multiple stores to get some of those basics. One of the lanes of Highway 7 has been open for essential travel, so there is hope supplies will be coming in here, but it will be a slow process. And some people we spoke to today didn't have time to wait. I'm ready to work through why they are here. Using his military training, this volunteer is coordinating okay. a massive okay. undertaking. How many are in the second booking? Four. There's four, yeah. Trying to help all these people get out of Chilliwack by air, and for some, time is of the essence. I build up lots of potassium, phosphate, sodium, and I start swelling up with lots of fluid, and I just body slowly shuts down basically. 22 year old Mitchell Dick is waiting for a kidney transplant. He goes to Abbotsford three times a week for dialysis but floodwaters have made the 30 kilometer trip impossible. I just thought like man this might not do immediate damages but this is definitely gonna shorten my lifespan if I don't get there quick. And it's not just getting out. Nothing can come in either. Some pharmacies say they are already rationing medications. We don't have any more um medical puffers and things right now. We grab the wrong stuff in our panic to leave. We grab the empty stuff instead of the full stuff. <laughs> Where's the car does it start? The Attiers, including three kids under seven, were evacuated from the community of Yarrow in Chilliwack. They managed to find inhalers for their kids with severe allergies, but food is another problem. There is no fresh produce. There's no bread. There's no milk. There's, there's nothing in there. <laughs> it's kind of insane. Stuart Cutter went to almost half a dozen stores to find basics for his family of seven. I'm wondering what this next couple weeks is going to be like. Um, and we're already sharing with our neighbors. In hope, a similar situation, but some supplies and even meals prepared by community members in Surrey have been flown in. It's, uh, it's an emotional time. Everybody's uh, coming together and helping where they can. Much harder to fly in, gas. Pumps are running dry. Well, my husband has a full tank, so we'll be sharing a car. I've been to three different gas stations now and nothing. Now tonight, we've learned that Highway 7 between Hope and Agassiz has been reopened to allow stranded travelers to get out from Hope to Agassiz or to here in Chilliwack and perhaps to continue into Vancouver. But once they get out, that highway will be closed again for more repairs, so improvements, but they are slow ones. Ian? Thanks, Susanna. Today, the Prime Minister in Washington for the North American Leaders Summit urged people in those devastated areas to hang on, saying more federal help is on the way. I can confirm that there are hundreds of Canadian Armed Forces members uh, currently headed to British Columbia to help with everything from supplies to evacuation to whatever is needed. The new commitment will bolster the help already sent to B.C. The three military helicopters deployed earlier this week have evacuated more than 300 people so far. Now let's shift to the B.C. interior where movement itself remains difficult in several places. The city of Merritt still largely underwater, still hard getting in and out of Lillooet, where four people are now missing after Monday's mudslide. Aaron Collins has the latest from those communities tonight. 
from the air, the impact of this flood easy to see. This stretch of Highway 99 still impassable. The search for cars and passengers swept away by a mudslide here ongoing. Life has stalled in the city of Merritt, too. Floodwaters forcing its 7,000 residents to flee. Officials say they won't be able to return anytime soon. And some will never be back in their homes. This house simply floated away. It went under. It just, the river just took it under and gone. Within seconds. But amidst the loss, a familiar refrain heard across BC's interior. All our stuff that we've gathered in 20 odd years, or some of our animals are in that house. It's all gone, but we're not the only ones. Some in BC are asking how so much water came so fast with so little warning. The answer may lie in the scorched woods that line much of BC's interior burnt in record-setting wildfires this summer. The roots from these trees are supposed to hold the dirt in place. When heavy rain falls, that slows the water. And when the trees burn, that layer of protection is removed, making major floods and mudslides more likely. These are unprecedented times. Uh, we, uh, we need to start preparing uh, for a future that includes more regular events like this, and we fully intend to do that. The Premier is likely right, according to this climatologist. It is the year, I think, that climate change has begun to bite deep and hard in Canada. It's a reality for millions of Canadians. A frightening new normal that has many wondering when, not if, the next once-in-a-lifetime natural disaster will strike. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Kelowna. And a moment ago in Aaron's story, we heard from a family who suddenly lost everything. Paul and Pam Velter from Merritt, and they describe floodwaters literally washing their house away. Here's a little more of their story for the record. It was like one minute we were sandbagging, I looked up, and we were completely surrounded in water and debris and things of our property were floating by us. Yeah, it was awful we started to see that it started to erode underneath our house. So we grabbed what we could at the moment and yeah, we got out. The front part that faced the river, the floor went. So I entered the house stupidly and then a big crack. Gone, just gone. It went under. It just, the river just took it under and gone. Within seconds. That was our retirement home, and it's all gone now. Our trees are gone, everything's gone, but we're okay. We've lived through COVID, we've lived through the fires, and we'll live through this. Now, certainly for the Velts and so many other families, more rain is the last thing they want, but more is expected, and of course, that could complicate things here. CBC News meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us now. And Johanna, what are we expecting? Yeah, Ian, we've sort of been in between systems for the past 48 hours, but a storm that was looking to hit mainly Washington now is going to clip southern BC in the next 24 hours. But we're just talking 5 to 10 millimeters for the impacted area rather than the 250 millimeters we saw in 24 hours earlier this week. So while no raindrops would be ideal for those impacted, likely not going to see a big uh, response to this rain in the next 24 hours. Ian, the other side to the weather story, though, the temperatures. This is the second night will dip below the freezing mark. Not great news for those out of their homes tonight. Yeah, no kidding. And, and Johanna, what do we know about the water levels across the province tonight? Generally, Ian, all the water levels have started to recede for the rivers. Uh, we saw that drop late last night. It may take another couple of days, though, for the overland flooding to drop. We're sort of dealing with two different disasters. We have the uh, washouts and the mudslides cutting off roads and highways. And we also have the overland flooding as rivers burst their bank. And it sort of took until last night for the rivers to finish responding to all of that rain. And it may take until the weekend uh, to get down to dry level. Uh, luckily, though, Ian, we don't have a big rain event in the forecast until early next week. It's been hard to predict the exact drop of water levels. A lot of our gauges were inundated uh, Monday during the event. 
So nice having you back on base. Thanks, Johanna. Thank you. All of this is happening in a region critical to getting goods into and around the country. Essential connections have been destroyed. Jamie Strachan looks at the effort to get the supply chain back on track. In the light of day, the damage done by the rains that have swamped much of BC is jarring. Getting our roadways and rail back up and in operation is our number one priority. The unrelenting rain has cut off highways and destroyed key rail lines creating more uncertainty for a supply chain already strained by a global pandemic. This is a huge job, but collectively we're up to the challenge and we will get things opened up again just as soon as we possibly can. At Canada's busiest port in Vancouver, two important rail lines that service the terminal are down, meaning trains can't be loaded. Well, there's already congestion at the port, so the mere fact that those trains are stalled uh, means that that is going to back up further because those ships are still underway. They're coming here regardless. Trucks are being used to keep things moving. It's all hands on deck. It takes about 400 trucks to move what one train can carry. There will be disruptions. It won't be as smooth as it was, um, but it is coming. Um, you know, so there's no need uh, to go out and, and buy a month's worth of groceries this afternoon. All Canadian highways leading to the lower mainland are closed, so trucks must cross the U.S. border to access alternate routes. Contingency plans in place for natural disasters like earthquakes have been activated to make that easier. They can move and just literally use uh, you know, the interstate systems and uh, the highway systems in Washington state as a detour. The premier says the province has the tools to rebuild quickly and is asking people to stay calm and consider others. Please do not hoard items. What you need, your neighbors need as well. We are confident that we can restore our supply chains in a quick and orderly manner. A big challenge, but officials insist key supply routes are being brought back online as quickly as possible. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. So we've shown you damage all around the province, but here in Abbotsford, officials are dealing with some of the most urgent concerns. And the situation is changing by the minute. As I mentioned, the water behind me has receded from yesterday. That's some good news in a city with a lot of other challenges. And joining us now is the mayor, Henry Braun. And Mayor Braun, about 24 hours ago, you issued an urgent warning for people in nearby Sumas Prairie. How are things looking in your city tonight? Well, I must say I feel much better tonight than I did last night. Uh, we had some serious uh, concerns and uh, I'm just so pleased with how our community has responded. And yet, you know, still dealing with an emergency in places like the Sumas Prairie. How did things go today in terms of moving people out of there? Uh, I think we're, we're down to about three or four properties that we will visit tonight, but uh, we are in way better shape than we were last night. The water has receded at the western end of uh, Sumas Prairie, but it rose a little today uh, at the other end, and that is a concern. But I think we've stabilized, we're stabilized. I am waiting for tomorrow morning to see what happened during the night. And a remarkable thing is happening in your community in terms of kindness and volunteering. Uh, tell us about that. Oh, totally. I, I, my, my email inbox, I can't keep up. There is just such an outpouring from our community wanting to know how can they help? Where can I, what can I do? Where can I give? And so we're arranging that. We're fielding probably 2,000 calls per hour at, uh, or per day at uh, City Hall mm -hmm. and uh, just contact our local number and our staff will direct you to the right people. And I got to say, this is not just the mayor saying that. We've experienced it as well. Two nights in a row, strangers have delivered food to where we are. So uh, a terrible time, but a remarkable response from your city. Uh, mayor Braun, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, I'm pleased to be with you. This is what it looked like yesterday as we flew in a helicopter over Highway 7, northeast of where we are tonight. The aftermath of mudslides that caught so many off guard. And tonight, we'll hear from one woman who was driving home Sunday when her car was suddenly swept away. All I could hear was the sound of just the rocks and the trees sliding around me. I'll be back with her story of survival a little later. But next on The National, we head to Washington ahead of a high-stakes meeting. The U.S. Uh, could do worse than rely on its closest friend. As the Prime Minister prepares to meet the U.S. President, the battle brewing over a plan that could hurt Canadian workers. They're just going to kill the industry. 
And CBC News has learned a big change is coming to the border. Why some Canadians may no longer need that COVID PCR test. We're back in two. Welcome back. Justin Trudeau is in Washington for two days of meetings, today with U.S. congressional officials, tomorrow with the leaders of Mexico and the United States. The U.S. Uh, could do worse than rely on its closest friend, its oldest friend, its most reliable friend uh, for ensuring uh, that we're able to be strong and resilient in, uh, in a North American context uh, in an unstable world. But on Capitol Hill today, the Prime Minister also pushed back on Joe Biden's Buy America policy. That includes a huge incentive for American-made electric cars. As Magda Gabrasalasa explains, Canada's auto industry sees it as a Canadian job killer. We're going to be building again. Joe Biden came to Detroit to drive home his Build Back America plan. But part of it could lock out Canada's auto sector creating new purchase incentives for consumers to buy American-made, union-made clean vehicles. His proposed social spending bill includes a $12,500 electric vehicle tax credit. Over time, only vehicles assembled in the U.S. with union workers and American batteries will qualify. The actual effect of the uh, credit is worse than anything threatened uh, by Donald Trump before. This industry insider says the American incentive could crush Canada's auto sector. We make 2 million cars a year, and then we export 75% of them to the American consumer. If uh, the American consumer has an option to buy a vehicle that's $12,500 less, but it has to come from an American plant, you take the cheaper vehicle and we get less orders. And there's this worry, weaker commitments from car makers to make electric vehicles in Canada. It's just going to kill the industry. If you do go through, I hope Canada retaliates with something to save some Canadian jobs. Not everyone is on board with Biden's plan. What about Canada? That includes Democratic U.S. Senator Joe Manchin. Passing the bill requires his vote. Tonight, Canada's Deputy Prime Minister set the stakes high. The way they have formulated this incentive really, really has the potential to become the dominant issue in our bilateral relationship. Prime Minister Trudeau is expected to bring up the EV credit with President Biden during tomorrow's summit. But the White House made it clear today it has no plans to turn things around. Mark de Gebrecht, CBC News, Washington. There is some welcome news on the way for fully vaccinated Canadian travelers. The federal government is expected to announce it will scrap the pricey PCR test for short trips across the border, but how short is short? Rafi Bujikanian has the details tonight. For months, travelers could have crossed the border here in a matter of minutes, but it hasn't been worth the trouble. Because of the price of the test to come back and all is involved, we canceled the concert, Rolling Stone concert. It was yesterday because of the restriction. But things are about to change for visitors like that. If you're fully vaccinated and headed to the U.S. for less than 72 hours, you won't need a PCR test to get home. I just got news of that this morning and it was like early Christmas. Canadians aren't alone in their rejoicing. This store in Washington state relies on business from British Columbia to keep the lights on. They can't wait to get back down and but people that have historically for years and years spent Thanksgiving down on the point or just come down to, like I said, go fill up their gas tank, grab some groceries, go to the cafe and walk along the beach. But the welcome news doesn't go far enough for those planning longer visits. We need to do uh, get rid of this test altogether. This is highly punitive to ordinary Canadian families and it affects Canadian businesses. When it comes to visitors on short trips, some experts say there is good reason to scrap the test. The turnaround time for the test is such that it, it becomes almost meaningless because you would have to get the test done almost as soon as you cross the border um, in order to have a result by the time you want to come back. The government is hinting that there is more to come. We are looking at uh, making, uh, making steps to, uh, to loosen up uh, requirements while at the same time keeping Canadians safe. But a New York congressman says he's heard from the prime minister that other changes will come in phases. 
An official announcement is expected Friday. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Turning to the COVID story now, and today in Nova Scotia, flashes of anger from citizens and officials. The cause, three deaths attributed to a religious gathering that violated COVID-19 measures and defiance rather than public remorse from the pastor who organized it. Kayla Hounsell explains. Oh, come all ye faithful. As the faithful gathered at Gospel Light Baptist Church this Sunday, their attention quickly turned to the COVID-19 outbreak directly linked to their church. It is an unfortunate thing that happened, but it happened. No need to question Here's what happened. Back in October, the church hosted other churches at an event it calls a camp meeting. Around 100 people attended over multiple days. I followed what God wanted us to do. Pastor Robert Smith did not require proof of vaccination, even though the province's COVID-19 rules state he should have. Today, he was fined more than $2,400. He has not responded to repeated requests for an interview. They don't believe in vaccination by and large, a very low vaccination rate. The province's top doctor says as a result, COVID-19 made its way into a long-term care home and a group home for people who live with intellectual disabilities. Three people have died. Nicholas Trenholm's great aunt Vicky was one of them. It's just an apology goes a long way. It's just the dig in and fight approach of the pastor has really taken the anger to a new level. The Premier says he wants more people fined. The comments minimizing the loss of life are completely unacceptable and totally disgusting. Trenholm says he and his family used to be parishioners here, back when it was the United Church. Many of his family members were even married in this building, now clearly linked to the death of another. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Next, I'll be back from Abbotsford, British Columbia, with a story of survival. A woman who was driving home Sunday when her car was hit by a wall of mud and trees. All I could hear was the sound of just the rocks and the trees sliding around me. She'll describe the dramatic hours that followed after she was swept away in a mudslide. We'll be right back from a province under a state of emergency. Let's return now to our top story, British Columbia under a state of emergency. The scope of the damage here in Abbotsford, best seen from the sky. Large chunks of land still inundated by floodwaters, hundreds forced to flee their homes and many still uncertain when they may return. One of those lucky enough to be at home tonight is Chelsea Hughes. She was among dozens of people swept off the road by a mudslide Sunday night while driving on Highway 7, northeast of where we are in Abbotsford. I spoke to her earlier this evening from her home in Surrey, British Columbia. Chelsea, your story is so incredible. Tell us about the moment that mudslide hit your car. Thank you. Yeah, I. Um, it's hard to. It's hard to find the words to describe it. I. I just. I don't know if you've ever, ever seen the movie The Impossible about the family that gets taken out by the tsunami, but just the being thrown around. Um, luckily, I was in my car, but pushed through the earth by the earth. It, it, all I. All I could hear was the sound of just the rocks and the trees sliding around me. Um, yeah, it was it was pretty unreal. Uh, I can still I can still hear the initial hit against my car and I was just in shock. I and then all of a sudden it stopped moving. It, it must have lasted a, a number of seconds, but I I just I don't remember any of it except for the sound that it made. And then all of a sudden it was done and I was just in shock and afraid to move because I didn't know if I was injured. Um, eventually was able to, of course, make it onto the top of my car where we, we did uh, spend the majority of our time waiting for search and rescue. I heard some people on the radio on Sunday night who were on that road who said they heard cars honking and people yelling for help. That could well have been you among other people. How long did you have to wait on that 
cold night. There were no lights around, so very dark area. How long did you have to wait to get rescued? Yeah, well, um, my car horn would not work. I tried it, uh, but it was pretty beat up in the process. We were yelling pretty loudly. I did have um, a few comments on the Facebook post that I shared, people saying that they actually did see us. Um, they were stuck between those slides and they could hear us yelling. So it was pretty surreal to, um, to be connected with people that were in that circumstance, just in a different perspective. But we were we were waiting on top of our cars in the cold rain um, for five and a half hours before a search and rescue came. We have just uh, less than a minute, but but how does it feel to be back home? It feels surreal. Um, the whole time I was sitting on top of my car, I just remember saying to myself, I'm going to be at home snuggling with my cat in my bed before I know it. And then I was and um, and the whole process being in the hospital, uh, driving in home, getting out of Chilliwack in time before the flood started. I just I, I cannot believe how how blessed I am through all of this. Um, and and I, I cannot be more grateful. And, and speaking of grateful, we should shout out uh, to the Agassiz Fire Department. We have just seconds left, but I guess they're the ones that actually came and got you, eh? Yeah, the Agassiz Fire Department search and rescue team were just absolutely incredible and definitely owe um, an immense amount of gratitude to them as well. A dramatic story with a happy ending. We couldn't be more thrilled. Thanks for speaking with us. Thank you so much. And Adrian, I think she also credits her experience as a yoga instructor for having the state of mind to think warm thoughts as she spent, what, more than five hours in the cold and the dark waiting to get rescued. Yeah, no kidding. That description of, of that helplessness of feeling your car being shoved along, I mean, it, it really puts you there. And listen, as we keep hearing these stories, Ian, it is really important to understand why we're in this dangerous situation. So next, we're gonna take a look at what is making Abbotsford so vulnerable right now. We found part of the answer to that question in a decision made a century ago, plus a conversation about how to protect the people there in the future. It's devastating to everybody, the farms, all the animals lost, everybody's losing their homes and, you know, there's really no relief and no information. The human details of what's happening in B.C. right now are painful. There is loss, there is uncertainty, and in Abbotsford, there is grave concern that the situation could get much worse. The area is so vulnerable that some have been sounding the alarm for years, and it's partly because of a big decision made a century ago. From above, when you see what the water's newly done to the Sumas Prairie in BC, you're really looking back in time. A hundred years ago, that plain was a lake, and when the rains came, sometimes that lake stretched to 80 square kilometers, frustrating for farmers along its shorelines. So in the early 1920s, the lake was drained to create lucrative land that now sits below sea level. This is where most of the province's dairy and poultry now come from. The prospect of disaster always looming. Journalist Tyler Olson has been watching the water and the shifting climate for years. Water flows downhill and absent infrastructure like Barrowtown Pump Station or absent the, the, the water making its way to the Fraser, it will go to what used to be Sumas Lake. Add the decision to drain to a quirk of nature and you have the core of the crisis, a name you hear spoken of with a lot of concern now, the Nooksack River. Curious, because look at the Nooksack. It doesn't travel anywhere near Canada. But when it floods, the water flows north between those mountain ranges right into that low, flat Sumas Prairie. The Barrowtown pumps, whose job it is to drain those waters, sit just to the north of it. That's why volunteers were frantically sandbagging those pumps overnight. The biggest in Western Canada, they have to be protected. The need for better protections long fought for and argued over. Bringing the dikes up to standard is expected to cost more than $400 million. And that's in Abbotsford alone. And Abbotsford is the largest municipality in BC, but it's by far not the only one along the Fraser River. And so it requires a lot of international cooperation it also requires 
cooperation between municipalities and counties. And it seems like that's where in the last decade, even when we didn't know this threat exists, that work didn't get done. In the absence of physical protections, all that's left to safeguard lives and livelihoods is a solid alert system. But in BC, it's a patchwork of systems. Different municipalities, different apps, different approaches. That wall of water was coming for BC, advancing as early as late last week, unstoppable. The land weakened by wildfires, unable to hold it back. So this is where the conversation has to turn to adaptation. We know climate change is accelerating these extreme events. So what do you do about it? International cooperation, billions in infrastructure, that's not going to happen overnight. So are there any practical options for that? Let's bring in Jason Thistlethwaite of the University of Waterloo, who specializes in climate risk management. So Jason, I, I know the economic impacts of climate change are a priority for you, that, that you deal in practicality. So, you know, let's talk about them. You know, what's something that could happen right now to arm people with the information about where they live and work? The first priority should be knowing where the risk is. And in Canada, we struggle to do that because we don't have accurate and up-to-date maps that incorporate risks like wildfire and flooding. They can then inform not only property owners about whether they live in a high-risk area, but most importantly, municipalities and provinces, we need to figure out the high risk areas, uh, the places that where the risk is, is most significant. It's in these areas where investments and strategies supporting adaptation are going to have the most benefit for uh, the community and the country. Anything strike you about other protections that, that, you know, that need to happen immediately? The one thing that I think is very evident and clear in the images that we're seeing out of British Columbia is that our critical infrastructure is not protected from climate change. Um, the images of the water pouring over the Trans-Canada Highway, this is the main supply route between uh, the east and west part of the country. So uh, the fact that we aren't, we don't have one of our major supply chain routes protected, uh, despite the fact that it is in a floodplain, uh, really did catch me by surprise. Um, and in addition to all the rail links that have been destroyed too, uh, we need to be paying much more attention to our critical infrastructure. Uh, you know, emergency services, hospitals, wastewater, uh, which we also saw being flooded in British Columbia. Is there something you want leaders of communities, big and small, to hear right now? I think it's very important that, uh, in particular, local leaders, but also citizens, pick up the phone and advocate on behalf of climate change adaptation. There is not a big enough constituency or a strong enough constituency advocating for climate change adaptation in Canada. Uh, we, mitigation gets a lot of attention, but we are not prepared and we need to be doing more to bring uh, voices together to advocate on behalf of uh, defending and protecting our communities from climate change risk. Uh, we have about a six to 12 month window after this event where politicians are gonna be paying attention. Uh, and it's now we need to really need to hold their feet to the fire and demand the accountability uh, they have for giving us at the local level the resources we need to be able to make decisions to protect uh, our communities both now and well into the future. All right, Jason Thistlethwaite, thank you very much for this. Thank you. Extreme weather like what we've seen in BC this year is just one of the reasons why the cost of living in this country keeps rising. Next on The National, we will look at whether those prices are here to stay. I'm Angela Starrett. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. The devastation caused by historic storms and flooding in BC and whether more should have been done to prepare for it. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Tonight in British Columbia, we are seeing the costs of climate change in a very clear way. But today we also got a glimpse of its more subtle impacts. Canada's cost of living rose an annual rate of 4.7% in October. That is the biggest gain since 2003. And while fuel prices drove it, other environmental elements played their part too. Jacqueline Hansen shows us how it's being felt all along the supply chain. At Manning Canning Kitchens, it's not just the fresh pressed juice used in their products that is getting squeezed. You pick up the phone and you're like, is it going to be late, more expensive or available at all? 
production during the pandemic has been more complicated and more costly. The price of cardboard packaging jumped thanks to the spike in lumber and pulp. So have shipping costs by boat and by truck. Although gas prices fell at the start of the pandemic, they've recovered and then some. Statistics Canada says in October compared to a year earlier, gasoline jumped more than 40 percent. That may level off as oil prices start to come down off recent highs, but global supply chain troubles are ongoing. Factories around the world, ports around the world have seen workers sent home due to COVID, and it's very difficult to get production to catch up to the demand that we've had. The price of food in Canada also continued to climb in October, up almost 4%. The combination of higher shipping costs as well as some weakness in crops due to uh, adverse weather. So it's a, it's a multiple storm here hitting food consumers. A lot of our businesses For men in canning, price fluctuations due to weather are typical, but nothing like the past year. We use fresh pressed uh, raspberry juice and that's gone up 90%. That's because most of our raspberries come from BC and obviously they had the heat dome um, and that just killed the raspberry harvest. The Bank of Canada has said it's confident the underlying COVID-related causes pushing prices higher are temporary and that it is looking into the effects of climate change on price stability. But in the meantime, shoppers are certainly feeling all of it. It's really hard when everything's going up. I look at the flyers and see who has deals. You know, honestly, and while Houston is hopeful some of the extra expenses will start to ease. The environmental factors, it's hard to say, and, and how do you price that in? I mean, Jacqueline you know, Hansen, CBC News, scary. Toronto. Amid all the devastation and uncertainty here in British Columbia, we're hearing stories of bravery and resiliency. Next on The National, the moments of kindness in the face of disaster. We'll be right back. The images and stories from across British Columbia over the past few days have been staggering. But throughout the chaos, confusion and damage, there has also been incredible displays of selflessness, strangers helping strangers. Those acts of kindness, big and small, are our moment. Last night, they came over from the island. Uh, we were getting lots of phone calls. People needed help, needed medication, get out of home. So he came over. Got in touch this morning, launched the boat at first light. When I came down here to a uh, house sit uh, in Yarrow, there for my parents, I looked down my road and this 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 flood of water. It was like a it was like a pooling waterfall. I just waited there, expecting the power to go out. And uh, you know, I'm in, the, in the dark there with my dog and my flashlight. Three three great guys from the Coquitlam Fire Department. They were super down to earth and, and chilled. They're like, hey man, we got gotcha. you. Know, uh, just let's get your dog here. They were. They, they loved him. They grabbed him and hugged him and kissed him. And I, uh, by the time they got to me, the water was literally to my windowsill. So outside, that's like six or something feet. It was unbelievable just to know that people are uh, random strangers. I don't even know. It, it was like they're talking to me like I was their closest friend. I'm here with uh, eight of my family members, my, my wife, uh, my two of my kids and their spouses and two grandkids. The outpouring of uh, help and offers to help and places to stay has been overwhelming. And uh, we we were absolutely fortunate to, to come across this place. And the, and the staff here has just been amazing. Um, they've got 200 plus migrant workers coming in tonight and they plan on feeding them all. Uh, it's it, It's... It's just too much. It's actually crazy in town, the amount of people, they're handing out food, they're knocking on people's car windows. Everyone I know has opened up their home to strangers. My neighbor has six people, some in his shop, some on his floors. Um, my uncle has people, my sister took in five strangers. It's just, it's unreal. Yeah, this, this is extraordinary. Pe people are incredible. You saw Dave Swawoski there with, with so you know many people in his family. He said he had 20 minutes to get them out. That's it. But the way they're holding it together, this is you know some much needed good news. And Adrian, another kind of good news behind me, that road. Just in the hours we've been here this evening, the water has almost completely receded. So I know that's just one road in, you know, one example in a big city. But we heard from the mayor and we heard from Renee, uh, the water levels are receding, at least in Abbotsford. So tonight, 
fingers crossed. Good night.